ask Reverend Jamie to keep, keep just keep playing there. Keep the, the environment just circulating with worship. Because this is a time to worship. And I just want to say before God and man, you know how grateful I am to the Lord that you're here today. Knowing what could have been. And I'm grateful that you're still here. Could you read our scriptures for tonight in Isaiah 53? <laughs> Who has believed our report? And to whom has the arm of the Lord been revealed? For he shall grow up before him as a tender plant and as a root out of dry ground. He has no form or comeliness. And when we see him, there is no beauty that we should desire him. He is despised and rejected by men, a man of sorrows and acquainted with grief. And we hid, as it were, our faces from him. He was despised, and we did not esteem him. Surely he has borne our griefs and carried our sorrows. Yet we esteemed him stricken, smitten by God, and afflicted. But he was wounded for our transgressions. He was bruised for our iniquities. The chastisement of our peace was upon him, and by his stripes we are healed. And, and we like sheep have gone astray. We have turned every one to his own way. And the Lord has laid on him the iniquity of us all. He was oppressed and he was afflicted, yet he opened not his mouth. He was led as a lamb to the slaughter, and as a sheep before the shears is silent, so he opened not his mouth. He was taken from prison and from judgment, and who will declare his generation? For he was cut off from the land of the living. For the transgressions of my people he was stricken. And they made his grave with the wicked, but with the rich at his death. Because he had done no violence, nor was any deceit in his mouth. Yet it pleased the Lord to bruise him. He has put him to grief. When you make his soul in a make his soul an offering for sin, he shall see his seed, he shall prolong his days, and the pleasure of the Lord shall prosper in his hand. He shall see the labor of his soul and be satisfied. By his knowledge, my righteous servant shall justify many, for he shall bear their iniquities. Therefore, I will divide him a portion with the great, and he shall divide the spoil with the strong, because he poured out his soul into death, and he was numbered with the transgressors, and he bore the sin of many, and made intercession for the transgressors. These verses right here were spoken by God to the prophet Elijah. He wrote them down, and this was some 750 years before they ever came to pass. Jesus in the New Testament used Isaiah's words to describe what was going to happen to him. Ten times he used these verses, going back to Isaiah 53, to describe his suffering. You see, it wasn't just enough for the Messiah to die. If all that it would Required to forgive you and I of our sins was just for him to die. One rock to the head could have taken care of it. One spear to the heart. You say, well then why did he have to go through all of this? All of the things that he went through. It's called the crucifixion process. You see, the crucifixion process does include death but it includes so much more. You see, because your sin and my sin was so egregious to God that there had to be a price to pay for this. 
It had to include the sufferings of man. It had to include the atrocities of the iniquities and transgressions of man because it was so painful to God. But he had a plan. John made a statement in the last chapter of the book of John. He said, listen, all of these things were written. Jesus said in the 16th chapter of John before he went to the cross, before he went to the garden, he said, I spoke all of these things to you so that you would remember them. I told you what was going to happen before it happened so that when it happened, you know that it was what I told you would happen. And therefore, you can draw comfort in the fact that if I knew it was going to happen, then everything else I told you that was going to happen about the resurrection is true also. Draw comfort in that. That's your hope and that's my hope because he said because he has risen, you and I shall rise. Because he paid the price that you and I were supposed to pay. So death alone would not have paid that price. It says here in verse 3, it said he was despised and rejected of men, a man of sorrow acquainted with grief. You see, we were rejected. You and I were rejected. We were despised. Why? Because of the sin. It wasn't man being despised by God. It was the sin-ridden conditions that you and I were in that God despised. So the sacrifice would have to be a man who was despised. He said right there, he said he would be so despised that the people would refuse to look upon him. Wouldn't recognize why. The verse 4 gives us the real reason why he had to do this. He said, surely he has bore our griefs and he has carried our sorrows, yet we esteemed him stricken and smitten of God and afflicted. What does it mean? In other words, he said, we thought, we saw what he went through. We saw the burden that he was carrying and the sorrows that he was carrying, but we did not recognize that he was carrying them for us. We thought God was punishing him because of something that he did wrong. That's what they thought. They said he must have done something very, very bad for him to have to carry this sorrow and him have to carry and bear our woes. No, we didn't recognize that it was for us. We thought he had done something so horrible. All of the people watched him as he carried that cross as he bore those timbers down the road to Calvary. They thought he did something very, very wrong. But Isaiah made it clear looking back on the scriptures. He said, but surely, no, surely he bore our griefs and he carried our sorrows. Verse five says, he was wounded for our transgressions. You see, just dying wasn't enough. He had to be wounded. He said he was wounded for our transgressions. He was bruised for our iniquities. Bruising is bleeding inside. When you're bruised, you're bleeding, but it's inside your body. He was bruised and bled inside of his person for you and me. He didn't just bleed on the outside. He just didn't bleed for our physical body. He bled for our spirit of the man that is inside. Carried this grief. Isaiah repeated it in verse four. He said, yet we still didn't really understand why. We esteemed him 
stricken and smitten. He said, but he was bruised for our iniquities. The chastisement of our peace. You know, in the times of life where things are so confused and so scary that it seems like you can't find peace anywhere. It seems like inside you're so disturbed that the troubles seem to overwhelm you and, and all you're looking for in your spirit is just a place for your spirit to rest. You ever feel that? You can't explain it. You don't know how or what you're looking for. You just know that you need something to settle you inside. Without Jesus going to the cross, you and I would have never found it. We would have never found that rest and that peace. We would have had no hope in life. We would have had to go through everything that we have gone through and will go through in life with nothing but fear. Nothing but anxieties. Nothing but hopelessness. But because he says right there, the chastisement, we didn't deserve peace, people. We were born into a cursed environment and you nor I deserved peace. Mankind did not deserve peace after the rebellion against God who is the give peace giver. But he said he chastised your peace and my peace in the life, in the person of Jesus Christ. That is something that you and I ought to shout every morning for. Because I know you, like me, are many things that we face that scare us so bad and that cause us to have no hope. And when we call out to God somehow and somewhere and out of nowhere, settling begins to happen in your heart, in your spirit. That's because of what he did. That peace came upon me and came upon you because of this day called Good Friday. It was our hope. And everything we ever will face in life, you and I always, always, never, he's no respecter of persons. What he's done for one, he'll do for all. He's the same today as he was yesterday, and he'll be the same tomorrow. And if he promised peace today, he will give you peace tomorrow for whatever it is that you're facing. Why? Because the chastisement of your peace and my peace that we didn't deserve went to the cross of Calvary with this sacrifice. On this day, Nolan, this is why this is called a Good Friday. Because he bore our sorrow. What he did on the cross of Calvary has preserved our peace. Ain't no devil can take it away. Ain't no demon can threaten us and hide it, cause us. It is promised to every born again believer. And because of that peace, our spirit man can be at rest. But if that wasn't enough, if he just left it at that, that would be more than we could hope for, wouldn't it? But he didn't leave it at that. He goes on. And he said, by his stripes, every generation to generation has been healed. Give the Lord a praise offering. This word heal doesn't just mean for the physical healing. It means healing for the whole man, spirit, soul, and body. He was bruised, bleeding on the inside. He was beaten and whipped on the outside with his blood pouring to cover the complete healing of mankind. 
I know many people go through this life depressed and many people go through this life with no hope, but they don't have to. Not when we have a Savior that did what he did for you and I. I believe that this is one of the most important days that born-again Christians upon the planet need to observe. We need to remind ourselves that he did this and took this suffering so that you and I wouldn't have had to. Had he not come, this would have been your fate and this would have been my fate. He goes on to tell us, he said, listen, we all like sheep had gone astray. Every one of us went our own ways. Didn't matter where you went. Doesn't mean that one is worse than another. We all went our own ways of disobedience and rebellion. He said, but God, look at that verse there, part B of verse 6. But God laid, what did he say? Look at that. He laid upon him the iniquities of us all. The iniquities represent all forms of sin in the nature of each one of us. That's what it represents. And I love this as it jumped over into verse 7. Because when it jumped into verse 7, he said he was oppressed, said he was afflicted. That meant that he just did not, going through this week that we call the week of passion, he just didn't have one event that caused him discomfort. This whole week was painful. This whole week was treacherous. To the point that the end of the matter, when he ended up in the garden and he fell on his knees, we see the culmination and the building up of this suffering as he, like every human, under the pressures, he cried tears of blood. His sweat was blood. Because of the pain and the anguish, the mental torment. And had it not been for the God of gods, there is no God but God Jehovah. As Jesus cried out, Father, let this cup pass from me. But not my will be done, let your will be done. And the scripture says that he called out to the Lord, his father, and the angel of the Lord came to minister to him. This is our hope in each one of us. This describes right here that this was not a murder. Some in the culture of man would look at this and what happened and say, well, if this man was innocent, then what they did was murder him. Oh, yes, if we looked at it from the worldly perspective and the eye of flesh and we know that he did no wrong, then what had been perpetrated upon him was murder. But Isaiah prophesied and said, no, do not allow this world to get any glory for what's going to happen because you see this man Jesus was not murdered he gave his life as a sacrifice this is what it says right there Isaiah prophesied it 750 years before it would ever happen he said look he said he was afflicted yet he didn't open up his mouth he said like a lamb to the slaughter like a sheep to the shear he was silent and he did not open up his mouth he said they took him from prison and they judged him. They didn't even give him a trial. It was so unfair what they did. But life is unfair, isn't it? It's going to be unfair some of the things that you're going to go through. But our Lord experienced the unfairness of life. And the word says he shouldn't have had to. He was innocent goes on and says, who will declare his generation? Meaning, 
Who's going to pick up the lineage just after he's gone? He was cut off in the middle of his prime and had no opportunity to spread another generation. Oh, but that's what the world thought, right? But you and I are declaring his generation now. The question wasn't being asked from a negative standpoint. The question was being asked from a positive standpoint and say, now listen, the world would look and say, who would declare his generation? Meaning, who would deprive him of children? The world has deprived him of children, but our God and Father already knew that he would have children. He would produce and that God the Father would have children after children after children. He said that he was cut off in the land of the living and God made it clear. Why? Not because the men hated him and they wanted to murder him, but because God chose this to be. He said, for the transgression of my people. He was stricken. Verse 9 tells us that he, meaning Jesus, chose this for himself. He chose a grave with the wicked, meaning that he died for your sin and my sin. He became sin. And because he became sin, he couldn't be buried with what they would call the righteous, could he? He said he was buried with the wicked and with the rich, indicating that there was going to be some rich man sometime that was going to yield his tomb for Jesus to be buried in. This is a prophetic prophecy of Nicodemus's donation of his tomb to Jesus. The tomb that you and I now look at that is empty. It was prophesied 750 years before that. He goes on and says, Yet, verse 10, it pleased the Lord to bruise him and to put him to grief. That's our God. This is God's process of righting the wrong. And the, the Bible tells us that Jesus knew everything he would have to go through. He knew what he was going to have to go through through this week. But even though he knew what he had to go through, it didn't mean that he cherished the moment. In fact, I like the way that Paul said it. Paul said it this way. He said that Jesus, despising the pain, he looked through the pain for the promise of the resurrection. That's what he said. You see, sometimes life causes us so much pain that unfortunately we get ourselves stuck in the middle of the pain and we focus on the pain of life, not recognizing that we've been given an example of how to survive those pains, how to survive that hopelessness. And that it is not to get your eye caught up on the hurt and the pain, but look through it and to the promise that's on the other end. Because Jesus said, because I rose from the dead, because I walked through the valley of the shadow of death, because I conquered death and hell, you will walk through the valley of the shadow of death. You will not get caught up in your pain. You will not have to stay in your pain. Oh yes, you'll navigate through the pain, but you have the hope that you will arrive on the other side of the pain in the same hope of victory and promise that Jesus did, that he overcame through this week. Fifty percent of the New Testament was written about this week. Fifty percent of the New Testament was explaining and giving us a visual picture of what Isaiah prophesied in Isaiah 53. I love what it says here on out. It says, yet it pleased the Lord to bruise him and to put him to grief. But he knew 
that when he made his, in other words, when he allowed Jesus' soul, look at that verse right there. Verse 10, an offering for sin. This is what God the Father knew. This is what God the Son knew. That once this job is done, once he has made and paid the sacrifice for sin, he shall look at his seed, look at all of the work that's been done. He shall prolong his days. One translation says, once the job of dying for sin was done, he would bring him back to life. He would resurrect him from the dead. That was the promise right there. Now you and I are living some 2,700 years after this, standing here as a witness that this happened. We are witnessing, we are witnesses that this has happened. How do we witness? We know that the tomb is a empty. We witness that the tomb is empty. Allah's tomb still has Allah in it. Buddha, he's still in the tomb. Krishna, he's still there. But Jesus Christ, our Lord, I love the way that Isaiah described him. You heard me as I was praying. And all of the names of Jesus, that was all of the names that Isaiah declared him to be. The branch of the Lord. The wonderful. The counselor. The mighty God, the Prince of Peace, the Rod of Jesse. God Almighty, that came from Isaiah. The Redeemer, the Restorer One, the Anointed One. All of those names were proclaimed about him from Isaiah. But I'm going to finish with this. Let me show you. This Nolan, this to all of our grandchildren, and all of you that are here today proclaim this to our children. This was why. It said, after the work had been done and he offered him soul, his soul for sin, then he, God, can look at his seed, Jesus, and shall prolong his days, raise him from the dead, and he would know that the pleasure of the Lord shall prosper in his hand. From that point on, look out. It's nothing but harvest season. Why? The price has been paid. Souls are going to be saved. <laughs> Humanity is no longer going to go to hell. There has been a way for eternal life provided for you and me. His plan has worked perfectly in the hands of His Son. And now... There'll be an increase, is what he was saying in these verses. He said, why? Look at verse 11. Jesus is going to look, and he's going to see the labors of his soul, and he will be satisfied. The Father will look at everything that's been done and says, I put my stamp of approval that everything that needed to be done to wipe away the curse has been completed. It's finished. It's what he said. Give the Lord a praise offering. Somebody ought to shout on this. It said, why? Because he is, by his knowledge, by the knowledge of Christ Jesus, my righteous servant shall justify many. This is what Peter said in first chapter of second Peter. He said, all things that pertain to life and godliness have been given to man by the knowledge of the Lord, the Son. By the knowledge of what Jesus Christ did on the cross of Calvary through the suffering, the pain, the dying, and you and I have the hope and we've been justified. Justified means that you and I can accept his sacrifice and we become righteous just as if we never sinned. That's what it means. And we don't have to be crucified. But make no mistake about it, we do have to die. We have to die daily to this flesh. 
And as we die daily to this flesh, we will live to this promise that our sins will be forgiven. It says he will justify many. You and I will be justified. Look at that verse 12. Here is the crescendo. Here is the promise that we will celebrate on Sunday. Now I'm going to paraphrase what it says here. Some miss what it says. Some translations, you'll lose it. This is God speaking when he said, I, God the Father, who said in the beginning, God said, let there be light. This is who's speaking here. He said, I, God, going back to the verse 11, because of verse 11, I, God, will divide to him, to who? Jesus, the sacrificial lamb. One translation says, the greatest portion of my kingdom. What is the greatest proportion? What is the greatest part of God's kingdom? It is his God authority. Without the God authority, nothing can be accomplished. You have to have the authority. The devils won't run without the authority of God. You can't overcome without declaring the authority of God has already promised you to overcome. It's with that authority that we go forward and advance the kingdom of God. He said, he divided to him, to Jesus, the authority of heaven. But that is not all. If that's all he did, that would be enough to shout about. But look what Jesus did once he got it. It said, and he being Jesus, divided his spoils. What he received from this, all that he received, from taking back what was lost, he divided it. One translation says among the strong. Another translation says among the faithful. You and I are the faithful. What's it say in that translation? The strong. It says the faithful. The faithful saints. Jesus divided his authority to you and me. And it said, he, God himself, repeated again why he gave him this gift. And he repeated again how you and I received this gift that we didn't deserve. He said because he gave his life to death. He gave his life and died. That's why he said right there, because he gave his life and died and was numbered among the transgression, the transgressors. He bore the sins of many and made intercessions for the transgressions of each one of us. As we take communion tonight, we remember that this night was a night of suffering, was a night that was so riddled and torment in Jesus' mind, in his body, to the point that he cried out to the Father, 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 why have you forsaken me? He had to feel the complete separation and forsakenness that sin brings in the life of humanity before the work could be done. And after that, he said, it is finished. Sunday we will talk about what took place because of this. But tonight as we go home, we're going to go home in our minds mourning the death of Jesus because it was on this night he was placed in a tomb physically dead. As we walk out of here, we walk out of here with a sobering thought. Someday you and I are going to die. 
were going to be placed somewhere in a tomb, somewhere as we lay this body down. But you and I have the soberness of recognizing our mortality just like Jesus is as we remember that he died. And then Sunday morning, we can talk about what happened. Today is Friday, and it is a scary thing, but it's referred to as Good Friday. But I want to give you heads up that today is Friday, but Sunday is coming. As we prepare ourselves for the Lord's Supper, we need to inventory ourselves. Let me ask you, are there areas in your life where you know that you have sinned? Were there areas in your life that you know that you have been slacking and disobedient? If there are, do not partake of this Lord's Supper until you ask the Lord. Just say, Lord, forgive me. I know that you may still be struggling in those weaknesses, but my Bible says that all that call upon the name of the Lord, He will hear them and forgive them. Just trust that when you say, Lord, I know that I'm caught up into these things, but I am just having faith that you'll forgive me if I ask you to forgive me tonight. And when you do that, the Bible says you become a candidate to participate in the Lord's Supper. None of us sitting here today are without sin. None of us sitting here today are perfect. None of us sitting here today have overcome every shortcoming that we have. We are all fallen short of sin. But what we have is hope. We have faith that when we call upon the Lord, He will forgive us and He will justify us so that we can participate in this Lord's Supper today. Is there everybody in this room today want to be justified? Just say, Lord, justify me. Forgive me. Cleanse me tonight that I may participate and remember your sufferings. Let's pray. Lord Jesus, come on church. I want to say to all you back there, hey, teenagers, look at me. Look up. You can close your eyes. Just look up. Just pray with me, Lord. Justify me tonight through the faith that I release in Jesus Christ and what he has done. Thank you for forgiving me. Cleanse me. In Jesus' name, amen. I want to invite you to come and get the sacraments. And when you're finished, when you get them and everybody gets seated, then we will we will partake in it. So I want to sing this song that I wrote. I call it my resurrection song. I met Jesus one day as I knelt down to pray when my all on the altar I lay He took my burdens of sin gave me sweet peace within I know that I got the best of the tree you see I had no earthly treasures 
that I could offer him and my life was sore at you deep deep within my sins were so many and I held my head in shame but still for me he came I met Jesus one day as I knelt down to pray when my all on the altar I lay he took my burdens and sin gave me sweet I know that I got the best of the tree. You see, he left his home in glory where the streets were paved with gold and the angels all would sing as they sat around his throne. But he traded it all for an old rugged cross. And he came to die for me. I met Jesus one day as I knelt down to pray. When my all on the altar I lay, he took my burdens of sin, gave me sweet peace within. I know that I got the best of the tree. I know that I got the best of the trade. Scriptures tonight being taken from Luke chapter 22, verse 17. Jesus had gathered together and was sitting at the table with his disciples. This was to be his last supper that he would spend with them here upon this earth. He spoke the words that I will not participate in this supper tonight, nor will I drink of the wine tonight, but I will reserve it until we meet again after this is all over. And then he proceeded to lay down a pattern that you and I are to follow. We'll read the verses from 14 down to 23, and then we'll come back and we will partake of the Lord's Supper. When the hour had come, he sat down and the 12 apostles with him. Then he said to them, with fervent desire, I have desired to eat this Passover with you before I suffer. For I say to you, I will no longer eat of it until it is fulfilled in the kingdom of God. Then he took the cup and gave thanks and said, Take, eat, take this and divide it among yourselves. For I say to you, I will not drink of the fruit of the vine until the kingdom of God comes. And he took bread, gave thanks, and broke it, and gave it to them, saying, This is my body which is given for you. 
do this in remembrance of me. Likewise, he also took the cup after supper, saying, This cup is the new covenant in my blood, which is shed for you. Thank you. Father, we take this bread now and we recognize, as we have already heard the reading of your word, and we bless it tonight as it represents your body that was broken so that you could establish a church in each one of us now representing your body. We thank you for forgiveness. We ask you to bless this bread as we remember your suffering. As you bore our griefs and you carried our sorrows. Thank you in Jesus' name. Lord, we take this juice. We ask you to bless it. This juice that represents your blood. Yes. It represents the outpouring of life. But as your blood was poured out, life was made available to all of us. We plead your blood upon us here tonight. We recognize the power that's still in your blood. We recognize the hope that we have because of your forgiveness. We ask you, Lord God, to bless this again. Let your blood and the price of salvation be remembered as we take this tonight. In Jesus' name. Now, Father, we close this service in the name of Jesus. We ask you to receive this worship of this last song yes. as a token of our thanksgiving. Help us in these next three days to have this visual of you being laid in the tomb to recognize not only that you were fully man but that each one of us are fully man. That someday we will lay our bodies down. But like you on the third day, you rose again. We shall raise again. In Jesus' name. Let's all stand and sing this song.
Thank you for coming tonight. Turn around and give somebody a high five and tell them Sunday's coming. 